This is episode 51 of the Immunology Podcast, The Journey of Cells with Dr. Doug Green. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Rath. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Immunology Podcast, rate us and leave us a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have Dr. Doug Green from St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital on the podcast here to talk about his research exploring the molecular interactions of single cell survival and how immunology affects health and disease in whole organisms. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in immunology news coming up. But first, the annual meeting of the American Association of Immunologists will take place from May 11 to May 15th in Washington, D.C., and Immunology 2023, as is known, provides also, besides all the scientific uh, lectures, multiple career development sessions, including how to convert your CV into a resume, how to have a successful postdoc experience, how to interview for a job, a workshop about NIH grants, and one-on-one -on -one consulting sessions to help ensure your career success. So very helpful uh, alternative sessions. Don't forget that advanced registration ends on May 10th, so the day before, and you can visit www.immunology2023.org for more information. Hello, Jason. Hello, hello. How are you doing today? Good. You know, it's, uh, it's becoming spring break season, so I'm heading out here visiting a little part of Pennsylvania, not too far near the capital, with my son in a couple of days, hiking a cave or two he likes to do and then going to the civil war museum because my son likes museums civil first of all not surprised your son likes museums second of all civil war museum what exactly is that one of those museums when you have like reenactments i mean reenactments are very big in pennsylvania but i think this is just a museum about the civil war okay so are you excited i what are you gonna uh, try to learn i don't know we'll, we'll go see stuff i mean it'll be cool to just like I think he's going to be in the battles and seeing just how big everything was at the time. We'll see. And then you're going uh, hiking to caves? Yeah, the Indian Echo Caverns, as it's called. There's a cave we're going to. Like He likes to hike in subterranean caves and other stuff. You know, when the, when the time this, this uh, episode is aired, you know where I will be? Vacation, I hope. I will. I will be enjoying the cherry blossoms in their original place of fame. Do you know where, where that is? No clue. Japan? Japan. You got it. I'm going to be enjoying uh, getting, eating some, I don't know, ramen, some sushi, visiting some multiple Buddhist temples or, I don't know, kind of temples. They have many different sorts uh, and enjoying uh, a completely new uh, culture. It's going to be very fun. So you're going to go into the mountains at all? Well, we are going to uh, spend a night in a place called Koyasan, which is a little, um, like it's, uh, it's a village made of monasteries, of Buddhist monasteries. And then you go and you stay overnight there and then you join the prayers and then on the following morning. So we have to walk a little bit there. And then we're going to try to walk uh, close to Mount Fuji, but Mount Fuji is closed because it's too early in the season. So we're just going to see it from afar and see how close we can get. It's closed because like it's too snowy? Yeah. Yeah. It's too dangerous. But enough of uh, play and let's work. What are we going to talk today about? Well, I know how much you love T cells. Always. So I'm going to talk to you first about gamma delta T cells. Yeah, well, I love those. Well, they're fine. They're okay. They're okay. I yeah. mean, come on. You got to <laughs> I got to work with me here. I at least I'm offering you a T cell. Okay, yes, thanks. And there's a really great uh peptide name or protein name here in this paper called detectin. Detectin. Okay, what does it I asked me to detect something. Yes, it does. Shocking. <laughs> Okay, I want to shut up now and let you talk. So the paper is detected one signaling on colonic gamma delta T cells promotes psychosocial stress responses. The Nature Immunology, published the 20th of March. First author is Zhao Lei Zhu. Last author is Atushi Kamiya. All right, so I, I love this just because of how like bizarre the biology is. It's beautiful. 
so we know that differentiation of gamma delta C cells and how they behave is based on the microbiome. Not surprising. And we've also known that it sometimes involves lactobacillus species. So they show that specific lactobacilli species are involved in T cell differentiation. But um, what happens is, is that this differentiation leads to higher levels of IL-17 producing gamma delta C cells. So this, you know, these bacteria. So reduction, so if you reduce these bacteria, get rid of them, you have more IL-17 producing gamma delta T cells. So gamma delta 17 T cells. And they then go and traffic to the meninges in your brain. And at least in animal models result in stress response phenotypes. So if you like stress the mice out and then they avoid other people or rats out and they avoid other people or not, that's a psychosocial stress response model. And they show that if you have more of these IL-17 colonic cells and they migrate to the brain, you get more of that abnormal stress response. So it was kind of already known. And so they show, again, they, they remind people and reshow the work that some of these lactobacilli are involved in the gamma delta T cell function. And they demonstrate that it, they talk some about the back history. It's involved in colitis and stuff, but they demonstrate that these lactobacilli are involved in the sensing there. And then they throw on top of this chronic social defeat stress model is how they're kind of measuring stuff. It's kind of a pseudo depression anxiety system. So they kind of go through the basic things. The specific bacillus is L. Johnsoni, two eyes. That's the specific lactobacillus. They find that mice susceptible to this model at baseline, just take wild type mice and get them stressed out. They have less of this. So that's kind of their first clue of this bacteria. They go through and um, show that there's these increased clonic meningeal gamma delta T cells by flow in the system. They do some knocking out and some pharmacological inhibition and show that these cells do indeed traffic to the brain. It's not in, in times lapse things. So this isn't just like they're in both spots, they move. So they do the studies to show that these, ce these cells move from the gut to the brain. And if you inhibit the peripheral cells specifically later on, um, then you can get rid of the, the response, right? So they lose their function to block social avoidance. So social avoidance is a stress response. If you inhibit them, then you get rid of that response. Um, so the antibodies, the TCRs, delta and gamma type of, type of work here. And then, and then they do this detected one thing and show that um, it's responsible for the T cell differentiation and uh, deficits. Um, and, and then they actually link it. So they showed the tectin one recognizes beta glucan polysaccharides from fungal cells. And the degradation of those saccharides is mediated by L. Johnsoni in the gut. So gut bacteria degrade a fungal wall component. And in the absence of those gut bacteria, you have more of the fungal component which detectin-1 activates, leading to more gamma-delta T cells, you know, Th17, so gamma-delta Th17 cells, which traffic to the meninges of your brain and make you sad and depressed and avoid people. I mean, to be honest, you're, you cheated because this is not really only a T cell paper. It's a gut paper. But it has T cells in it. It's a really good paper. I, I'm very intrigued about the results, but it does not count as, you know... This is not a paper for me. It's a paper for you, but that's okay. <laughs> it is your paper after all. But if you have feelings, but... it's for you too. Cause now <laughs> I don't have Ooh. feelings. No, but it, I mean, it is, it is almost scary to think that they can find such straightforward relation, like connections between very specific parts of the microbiome and very complex behavioral traits. Um, which makes me think, like, if I ever feel depressed, is it, should I be getting, like, probiotics or something to fix it? And I think that I've been, I mean, I think nowadays there's a lot of discussion about the, 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 the multiple effects of the microbiome on m many levels. But always I think the, the psychological level is the one that gets me the most because I'm thinking, gosh, we really are this 
and you know decipherable machine it's it's, it's insane you are a meat suit for the bacteria that are walking around inside it. yeah yeah is there is there any bacteria then if i eat more of these lactobacilli will i be happier they haven't gotten that far yet but there are people who are generally working on the role of the microbiome and depression and anxiety and trying to see if there's therapeutics there it's very interesting thanks for sharing jason okay um uh, then it's my time and i'm going to continue and i'm going to actually talk about tesla's for real like i'm going to have a very tesla centric um paper but also uh i like it because it's a kind of technology centered uh gene editing t-cell gene editing paper and it's kind of my cup of tea um so this paper uh it's called human t-cell generation is restored in cd3 delta severe combined immunodeficiency through adenine based editing first authors um grace mcauley and gloria uh, hugh Y-I-U, and from the lab of Donald B. Kahn at uh, University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. And it was recently published in, in Cell Press, sorry, in, in Cell. And basically, it gives us the blueprint or uh, the, the shows a very successful approach to repairing a very severe genetic uh, disorder. And I think it gives a lot of hope for the really the advancement or the the promise of using CRISPR for actually not not only doing designer babies but actually uh, addressing real very human very uh, pressing um, genetic disorders. So, as a so as a little bit of introduction, so uh, severe combined immune deficiency uh, in this case CD three based on CD three delta. Uh, deficiency is a yeah inborn error of immunity that is caused by the uh, mutation on the autosomal CD3D gene, uh, which is of course CD3 delta is part of the TCR. This is very important for the assembly of TCR complexes, um, and there is a particular uh, mutation which is found in a um, particular in some kind of self-contained human populations, in this case, a Mennonite population uh, that results uh, in a premature stop codon that ablates the presence of this CD3 delta protein and therefore really uh, um, impairs the proper expression of the CD3 TCR complex on the surface of T cells. And so patients that have this, uh, this SCID, this SCID, uh, the syndrome, they basically present with a very strong deficiency of mature T cells, alpha, beta, and gamma, delta, but they still have B cells and K cells. But in, in any case, the results uh, often lead to very, uh, so infant mortality. And there is some therapies available, most kind of possible is uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. But of course, this not always works. You have uh, often the risk of uh, graft versus host disease and, and treatment related uh, toxicity. So it's not a perfect solution. So what the authors are um, suggesting is that instead of trying to cure these patients with uh, someone else's uh, cells, uh, trying to just fix the mutation that generates the premature stop codon. And fortunately enough, it's a straightforward mutation. It's a citidine that is uh, a change uh, uh, sorry, it's, it's a change from, from a C to a T, so you need to revert back to original C. And they so they propose to doing that using CRISPR. And so basically what they do is they they establish, a, uh, they, they compare uh, different approaches uh, to replace that particular uh, nucleotide, and they compare using either a more traditional, I guess, would be called uh, approach in which you have a regular CRISPR uh, Cas9 protein in which you mediate a double strand break at, around that, that site. And then you use a uh, DNA template to induce homologic repair to exchange that nucleotide. But I think what is interesting, they, 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 they test that and then next to it, they test a more uh, modern approach, which is adenine base editing and this is i think is a very cool um 
I mean, is a very important new approach for, for CRISPR in which instead of having a functional CRISPR with these, uh, that can cleave the DNA, you use the binding area of the Cas9 and you have a Cas9 that is attached to an adenosine deaminase. And this is what basically what it does. It removes the amine group from the adenine, generates a nucleotide called I inosine, and this gets repaired in a way that the inosine gets excised. And then where there used to be an adenine, you get a guanine. And, uh, and uh, so you basically revert, you make from a, from a TA a pair to a GC pair. And that uh, way you can um, change very specific particular nucleotides. And in the case of this particular uh, uh, mutation, that's exactly what the, the it would be needed in order to revert back to wild type situation and generate from a stop codon back to an arginine uh, coding uh, sequence. And basically that's what they do. They compare, they start, they develop a couple of uh, base editors and they compare a, a different, uh, different uh, several ones. And they show that indeed uh, they can obtain much better results. For this particular uh, mutation, they, it works a lot better if they use base editors than if they uh, use uh, HDR uh, after a uh, double strand break. Um, and I think that's very nice because it really shows that um, you can get better. So there's very situations in which this system it can be very uh, promising. And I really like uh, to see this. Um, and they really go into... Uh, correcting this this deficiency, and they start testing uh, how this would work in uh, hematopoietic stem cells, and they show that by uh, re by correcting already this this mutation at the hematopoietic stem cell stage, uh, then they can generate, for example, if they put these stem cells into um, into uh, mice in humanized mice, they can they show that they can restore the generation of T cells, um, and that that is seems like a very uh, like the, the the they measure a lot of things such as off-target uh, changes. They measure the stability the, of the genome, which is always problematic when it comes when you generate double strand breaks. And they show that in mo more of most of the things they measure, they show that there is an advantage of using base editing versus uh, traditional double strand breaks and repair. Um, and I think that. They also, what they in the end, what they do, they also have some human hematopoietic, hematopoietic stem cells from patients that have the disease, and they show that in these cells they can indeed correct the mutation and restore the functionality of these obtained T cells. And I think it's really cool that they use a system called ATO, which I think is, stands for artificial thymus. Uh, organoid, I forgot exactly what it stands for, uh, that can that allows kind of to uh, recapitulate thymopoiesis uh, from uncommitted hemato hematopoietic stem cells uh, and to generate kind of a look into T cell development in vitro. And I didn't know this was a thing, so I thought it was very, very cool that they used this. And they use it as kind of on a model in, to look at which stages the, the the cells were arrested during development in a mutated situation and how this gets corrected when they edit and they revert to the wild type uh, code in there. Um, so in general, it was very interesting. So kudos to the authors. I, I always like, you know, CRISPR and T-cells and uh, things like that. It's always a, a good read. Um, and I hope that they actually can make this work for, for patients. Uh, I think it would be so promising if we can get really using this um this techniques for 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 these very very specific diseases that are very you know, it's very sad that these people that you know the, this these children uh, are affected by these diseases no it's interesting are they moving into human trials at any point um i don't think they mentioned that um but i would not be surprised if they are the problem i would i guess the problem of course is that very few people have this particular you no know, the mutation and this particular problem yeah so i'm not sure like the patient population is very very small uh but i i guess that you know i see i, I envision a future in which you have very standardized gene editing platforms that just allow you to we and we feel more comfortable just changing the the target gene um more easily 
and we can do this assays and we can generate these products with less uh, cumbersome um, approval. I think they show they do show that the cells are quite stable, that their, their genomes are quite intact, and the amount of off-target uh, changes is minimal. So I think that should be good enough for allowing them to use uh, at least some kind of um, compassionate use. I, I don't know. They don't mention that. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think that's going to be a bigger and bigger issue going forward because you're right. Like You're going to find all these ways that the platform can be helpful even if you can't you know, get a huge population, but then half the toxicity is with the target and off target effects. So it gets tough. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I think we're moving forward. This is definitely uh, a move, uh, a step forward in the right direction. Well, in another step forward in our scientific knowledge, uh, we're going to talk about immunoglobulin M perception by the FCUR. <laughs> um, Try not to sound like I'm swearing at you. Uh, in uh, nature where fcur2 yeah exactly uh came out march 22nd here uh first author Wai zhan li and last author is jun yu jiao um this is actually a pretty short explanation they finally get a crystal structure and a cryo em structure of immunoglobulin m bound to the fc receptor the fcu receptor for it that's basically the entire paper. It's actually kind of hard to describe the details of because it's one of these papers. It's an image of a crystal structure, a follow-up structure. But point is, it was hard to get. They show that the IgM is a is a dimer, right? Uh, uh, on the um, kind of on the binding section. Um, what they basically show is that the extracellular domain of the FCU receptor has this immunoglobulin-like domain within a disordered region, and that domain binds to a um, FCU-CU dimer, which is the part of the immunoglobulin. So basically, unsurprisingly, the stalk of the immunoglobulin, not the head, binds on either side and is a twofer to the receptor to the immunoglobulin. Now, something important here is that we know that IgM is weird. It binds B cell receptor complex, right? Membrane bound. There's monomeric versions, pentameric, hexameric. And so right now, this is a one-to-one -one in a way. They describe it as a two-to-one, but it's two of these other receptors to one double up in the middle. And they show that this pattern actually kind of repeats. And so if they do pentameric and hexameric assemblies, which now that requires cryo-EM because it's bigger, um, they show that it's a very similar process, a very similar binding. There's some differences because as you make a hexamer of IgM, things get buried, but it's the same general region. Some of the stock gets occluded. Um, they, of course, then, and it has that same stoichiometry. Uh, it's one FCU receptor to one FCU junction, which is the same as what we were talking about before. Um, so one to one to one. Can I make a comment? And I don't want to sound like a like a Greek purist, but it's mu. That letter is called mu. I know, but I can't say FC mu r. I'm going to say FC mu, like mu two, the Pokemon. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Co continue with your experience. I just needed to get this out of my out of my chest. So, so, so long and short, they have some really cool pictures in here. They do a good amount of work if you're a structural immunologist in terms of then ablating some residues to show key residues in the region that they would expect to be important, and lo and behold, they are. I think we've gotten pretty good at that at this point, and they and they kind of show the structure here, but it's it's interesting, and they also talk about how while the binding is a little different, there is a lot of conservation between how this looks and how other FC receptors bind with other immunoglobulins. So long and short, it's a big deal because they've never been able to get this before and start unlocking how IgM looks, um, which I think will be important downstream for, you know, anytime you're trying to make a drug or a therapy, having a crystal structure becomes important. Well, another immunoglobulin, we know how it looks like. It's always good. So for our last uh, science talk of the day, I'm going to ask you, Jason, do you know your mouse? Do you know your mice? Uh, some of them. Black six are evil little suckers. 29 are cuddly. How about Belfsies? 
they're even more cuddly than 129. Hmm. So, but you know, they're different from each other. I see not only in the cuddly and their uh, cuddly index, uh, I think it's all, also quite known that particular black six and valve C's, which are most, I would say, the two more, more popular inbred strains, they have some quite strong differences when it comes to their immune response. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And in this case, what we're going to focus on is in the differences between the TH1, TH2 responses between C, uh, black six and bulb C mice. Because usually um, there seems to be a stronger TH2 response in bulb C mice. Um, and there seems to have stronger humoral responses. And people have noticed that in, 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 in bulb C mice. And in this case, uh, this paper looks into the, how they respond quite differently to a parasitic infection in, in the plural, plura, in the kind of the chest cavity, and how, how to explain the differences between these two mouse strains. So the paper, um, it's called T Helper 2 cells control monocyte to tissue resident macrophage differentiation during nematode infection of the pleural cavity. And I have to say it's a very descriptive uh, text uh, title. It almost gives the whole thing away. But this is from first author Connor Finlay from the lab of Judith Allen at Manchester University. And basically in this paper, they, they start with this observation that when... Uh, Mice are infected with a particular nematode parasite called Lithomosoides sigmodontis, S. sigmodontis, uh, in, which infects the pleural space. Uh, there's a very kind of host genotype dependent profile of this infection. On the one hand, black six mice seem to be able to fend off infection quite efficiently. Most parasites are killed. Um, and there's some other, other work that shows that this resistance requires IL-4 and adaptive immunity. But on the other hand, bulb C mice, in bulb C mice, these parasites develop to sexual maturity around almost two months after infection. And there's an incomplete TH2 responses observed in this mice, um, strangely enough. And so what, what they do <clears throat> basically in, in this paper is to characterize the response in these two mice and try to find out what is the difference. One, 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 why is the source of this of this discrepancy between the mice? Um, so basically they infect biopsy and black six mice with uh, L. sigmodontis. And they see when they look into the, the, the cells that are infiltrating the, 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 the pleural cavity and that are interacting with this parasite, they see, they look at the most of the cell subsets, but they really focus on the, diff the main differences in the abundance and characteristics or their mononuclear phagocyte uh, part of the, of, the, of, the, of the cells. So mo mononuclear phagocytes uh, would include monocytes, and macrophages. And I think it's important to, to point, they are looking there, there's two particular subsets of, of macrophages that they uh, characterize. One of them are called SCMs or small cavity macrophages. They are characterized by being uh, CD1, O2 negative, got the six negative, and uh, F40, 80 low. And they are, believe, so they are mostly monocyte derived, so also derived from uh, bone marrow and monocytes. And on the other hand, there's a population of what they call, what is called large cavity macrophages. And those are more, have a more tissue resident uh, phenotype, and they express, and they, so the marker CD1, O2 uh, are, is expressed in the cells, and they have other markers such as TM4 the transcription factor GATA6, and they're high in expression of F, F, uh, 4080. And interestingly enough, these this LCMs are mostly seeded from fetal hematopoietic stem cells. So they are fetal derived. So they're not, uh, mo they're not recruited from, the, from monocytes. So, but when these two populations seem to account for a lot of the difference that they observe in the mononuclear phagocyte between these two mouse strains, and they uh, do see that in black six, black six mice have more cells with this LCM phenotype. And these cells express uh, more GATA6 
uh, and they used uh, CD thirty CD seventy three as a downstream uh, uh, response gene to to get a six to as a kind of a proxy. And they basically they look a lot into they they characterize the the, the mice and kind of long story short they show that that is the main population that is driving the difference between the responses to the nematode between the black six and the and the bulb C, and when they try to find what are the signals that are driving the uh, the repressence of these cells, on the one hand they look whether they are uh, there are those LCMs, the higher amount of LCMs of, of large cavity macrophages that are tissue resident. Where are they coming from? And they show that some of them are proliferating from previously existing populations, but many of them are a consequence of recruitment and uh, phenotypical transformation into this uh, tissue resident um, phenotype. Particularly, I think GATA6 expression is very important. And they uh, they are better at fighting off the the, the parasite. Um, so one of the main and and the main source of signaling or like the main instruction provided to these macrophages is given by IL four uh, and uh, Th two cells, and they are the ones that are really driving the LCM proliferation in this in the black six mice. Um, so basically, what they see is that. Um, by having a TH2 response in 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 this area, and it allows to this this population to develop. But in the case of the bulb C mice, they have a, uh, a, a kind of a weaker TH2 response, and they have a stronger TH1 as a consequence. They have a uh, so not as a consequence, but this might be because they have a stronger TH1 skewage that prevents the differentiation of these tissue resident macrophages and prevents the parasite rejection. So, and uh, they show that GATA6 expression by these cells is very important because if you if GATA6 is deleted in black six mice, all of a the sudden they respond to the parasite very similarly to bulb C, really showing that the differentiation of these tissue residents, GATA6 positive LCM cells is what is driving the uh, rejection of the parasite. Um, and that this is both fed by pre-existing LCMs and incoming monocytes that are very rapidly modified. And it's interesting because this relates to a previous uh, paper from the group in which they they thought that they was so they they didn't see this. They didn't see like the conversion. They didn't weren't sure where these LCMs were coming from because they they apparently converse so fast that there's very few uh, intermediate in black six very few intermediate cells that that are kind of testify to the, the transformation. And whereas in black, in bulb C mice, you have a lot of these cells that they are trying, they're kind of getting there, but they don't completely become tissue resident macrophages too. And therefore they don't drive the correct responses. So, you know, I think the, the most important takeaway uh, of this, of this paper is know thy mice, because uh, it really shows that if you see, if you do experiments looking to nematode responses, you're going to have completely different uh, paradigms if you take take one mouse or the other. So I think it's very important for us to keep that in mind that often results might be applicable to one particular genetic um, background and not another. Yeah, the mouse immunology thing has been something I've had to deal with a bunch, but it's interesting that it's so specific here. Have they figured out why they're skewed, the the bulb C and the black six? Like, what's causing it? I mean, we, we know that if you screw up one of the genes, you can make one like the other. But do they know at baseline why one's Th1 dominant and one's Th2? I don't think they 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 say that. So already there's already a skewage in in naive mice. So you already see this LCM populations are already more more present in. Uh, uninfected mice, but I don't think they show where where is the skewage coming from. Uh, I did not identify that in their in their public in the paper. While we discussed uh, henolith death, and we're going to be discussing uh, cell death with Dr. Doug Green at St. Jude's Children Research Hospital in a moment. Before we get to that. I want to remind you that if you're looking for tools to optimize your T-cell workflow and get high yields of these viable, valuable T-cells like Brenda always likes to work with, 
we have a webinar for you. Stem cell technologies and precision nanosystems have teamed up to produce a webinar on how to optimize T cell isolation, cell culture, and gene transfer methods. The webinar covers best practices and technologies to obtain high yields of valuable engineered T cells for your research. You can watch it for free at www.stemcell.com slash webinar hyphen T cell research. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, we are talking with Dr. Douglas Green. He is the Peter C. Doherty Endowed Chair of Immunology at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And he uh, is going to talk to us about the research that he's left us and I guess a little bit about uh, some career details. Uh, I, I I think he he's research is very interesting. And among the things I, I found interesting about uh, Dr. Green's uh, research is understanding the kind of the life journey of cells and particularly things about how cells live, how they die. And I hope that we can get to talk a bit about that. Um, so thank you so much for, for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. And by the way, don't call me doctor. Only my mother calls me doctor. If I may call you Doug? Yes, please. Maybe we can get started a little bit about um, cells and how cells live. And in the case of, you know, we, we have many cells of interest. I really like T cells. I know, I know there are other immune cells around there, you know, <laughs> or whatever. But I know that part of your job, part of your research has focused on, uh, for example, uh, uh, autophagy and uh, pathways and uh, apoptosis pathways in uh, T cells. So I don't know if you would like to talk to us a little bit about that, how that journey was and what would a listeners like to know about how cells live in this part? Sure. Okay. Um, if we're just thinking about cells, cells are living things. And as we know, living things live, but they also die. And for many years, I mean, uh, many decades, there were mentions of cell death as something that happens, and it wasn't terribly interesting. And when I first got into this, which was a long time ago, uh, and if you like, we can talk about how I got into it, um, it there was... Uh, I was an assistant professor. We started studying how cells of the immune system live and die. And all of the senior faculty told me that, um, why in the world is this interesting? This isn't remotely interesting. And so, honestly, I decided that made it more interesting. And we started to study it at the time. I told a graduate student who was working with me on this, Yu Fang Shi, uh, who's now a scientist in China very successful scientist. Uh, and I told him this is a perfect PhD project because apparently nobody cares. And uh, that lasted for about two years. And then the field exploded uh, into the study of cell death. And of course, it's a basic biological process, especially cellular suicide, where cells kill themselves. This is a biological process, and therefore, uh, its study will go on until we fully understand it. And there are still big holes in our understanding of this process. It remains a, if I can say, cell death is a vibrant field. To go along this line, you, you, I think one of the things you're most known for is the work on LC3, which I've always, which dates me a little bit and that I've always just known about it, so to speak, in, in terms of where I come from as being, you know, part of phagocytosis. But but link those two together. So you have cell death, apoptosis, LC3, which I think is being downstream of, you know, autophagy and other pathways. Then you have this you had this big linkage with phagocytosis. So you could kind of paint that picture together and Sure. Well, all right. A mantra in our lab is that we follow the data. Um, we follow the results wherever they may lead us. Um, we have a lot of discussions about this. Is this likely to lead us into some fresh new area or is this maybe a dead end and, and not worth putting a lot of time and effort into? Um, we were studying not cell death, but the failure of cells to fully engage cell death. And I think this is something I'm still passionately interested in. We've, um, let's call it failed apoptosis or failed suicide and how that changes a cell. And this was now more than 15 years ago. We were studying 
the conditions under which a cell almost dies. And we saw a prominent role for autophagy in that uh, struggle to stay alive and not actually fully undergo death. Um, and we characterized that and we were describing it. And a at that time, a postdoc in the lab, Miguel San Juan, uh, had a theory and he posed it that he thought there would be a link between autophagy and toll-like receptor signaling. And that's how it started. And he was investigating that and he was uh, inducing, uh, stimulating cells through toll-like receptors and looking at the uh, consequences for autophagy uh, days later. And along the way, he said, oh, come and look at this. I was using um, Hill yeast particles, Zymosin, to uh, trigger TLR2. And uh, it's funny, I see this ring of, uh, at that time we were looking at LC3 and that caught on for the name, but this is the ATG8 family of small molecules in autophagy. And he saw this clustered around the phagosome in just one cell. And he said, oh, isn't that weird? And uh, we kept saying, well, uh, maybe look earlier. And he said, no, no, I think it, autophagy is kind of somewhat slow. I have to look at later time points. No, I'm just not seeing it. Once in a while, I see it. And I kept saying, look early. And he said, well, what, five hours? And I said, no, no, like 10 minutes. As fast as you can get this onto the microscope, let's have a look. And he came running back in and said, come on, come on, come look. It's all over the place. We're seeing these rings of LC3, fluorescent LC3 around the um, around the phagosomes. We started studying that, and that turned out to be one of those great rabbit holes that led us to deep biology. And this was the lipidation of the ATG8 family members on single membranes, and it had a different set of rules from autophagy. And this led us into um, biological processes where the lipidation of ATG8 family members on single membranes. Um, now, Oliver Flory uh, in uh, the UK has called this chasm, the conjugation of ATG8 on single membranes um, as a general phenomenon, not only for phagocytosis, but also endocytosis and perhaps other single membranes. And uh, this has its own biology and its own consequences for physiology. So we've looked at this in the context of uh, anti-cancer immunity. We are uh, investigating its role in microglial activation and neurodegeneration, and more recently studying its possible roles in cardiovascular disease. And all of this, I think, is just an indication of how just one moment at the microscope can lead us into a whole new area of investigation. And of course, many laboratories have picked up on what we initially called LC3-associated phagocytosis, or LAP, uh, as an innate defense mechanism, and something that we explored in some of our early papers, but left that to the uh, infectious disease experts to follow up on. So, um, yeah, it's it actually came from looking at cell survival, asking a question about a possible link, you know, good question, wanted to investigate it, and now it's led us into a whole vibrant new field. Just for clarification for our listeners, which were the cells? Which which uh, cell subset were you looking at in the, in the microscope? So so initially we were looking at macrophages, and we've seen this in macrophages, dendritic cells, uh, other phagocytic cells, because we were mostly concerned with the phagosome. Um, we could see it basically in any cell that had the requisite components uh, that was capable of phagocytosis. But then... Um, more recently, as we started to look at LC3-associated endocytosis, uh, which, by the way, we call Lando because we needed a name for it, and LAE was too hard to say, and we were uh, after hours having a beer a at a local bar and tossing names around, and the Han Solo movie was coming out, and it just screamed <laughs> Lando. Uh, so we used the term Lando, which was picked up almost immediately. So sometimes having the right name for something matters, right? <laughs> I mean, Star Wars acronyms are very popular. Very, they're always a win. 
Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that was that was something a graduate student actually taught me many years ago. Uh, Josh Goldstein, um, who was a graduate student in the lab, who coined the term um, mitochondrial outer membrane permeabilization. And I pointed out that, well, it's actually technically outer mitochondrial membrane permeabilization because OMM is the abbreviation for the outer mitochondrial membrane. And he said, no, it's MOMP because MOMP is better. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so we we like acronyms. Uh, the S does, I think, everybody. Um, but to get back to LC3-associated uh, endocytosis or Lando, we see that in many different cell types. And again, it follows the same rules as the lab. So I think Oliver Flory is correct. It's a fundamental biological process of the mm -hmm. conjugation of ATG8 family members to single membranes. Yeah. And then in this, what would be the, 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 the function of, of, of Lando? Uh, if so would be more to mediate uh, autophagy? No, interesting. Interestingly, there we see a role for ATG8 conjugation to the single endosome membrane is involved, involved in uh, endosome cycling. So mm -hmm. it's the recycling of endosomes uh, that form by, for example, receptor-mediated endocytosis, and the recycling of some of those back to the plasma membrane seems to depend on this ATG8 conjugation. Um, which we showed for uh, TREM2, the, um, the A-beta receptor, putative A-beta receptor, probably the correct one. Uh, but we've also shown it for CD36, for TLR4, mm -hmm. and now for a number of other receptors that we're studying. Uh, and there we were studying that really in the context of inhibition of microglial activation, chronic microglial activation. Um, in, in neurodegenerative disease. So again, these are, we, we probe these things starting at that deep biochemical level or that cell biological level, but then we pursue them when we see big biological effects at the level of the whole organism. So I have, I have kind of a follow-up question, but it comes down to like very detailed kind of boots on the ground thing. So having, having done LC3 signaling a little bit in my life, I know that it's kind of a pain in the butt because you have the one and the two fraction and the split. When you were just figuring out what the hell was going on with this whole thing, how much of a pain was that? Like when you're having to look at double bands versus single band patterns, A and B, all of this, was this like, was this one of those things that like someone like ran their head against a wall for like six months to figure out there were fractions that were going on or the constructs? Or did that come out pretty easily? Because I, it's like notorious in the field when you deal with the Western blot. You're like looking for the band shift, which is just so much different than is it there or not, or phosphorylated or not, or something. Right. Um, yes, uh, you, of course you're right. There are challenges in the biochemistry. Uh, we took advantage, and we've done this for ever. Um, we always try to combine our biochemistry with imaging and especially live cell imaging uh, so that we can watch these processes occur. So we knew that LC3 was at least moving to that phagosome membrane. Now, when we could purify those phagosomes and interrogate whether the LC3 was lipidated, it was relatively easy to show that it was lipidated on those membranes. Um, so that wasn't our big stumbling block. The For us, the biggest problem has been, and I think now with some of the real improvements in image analysis um, and the fabulous work that's been done on machine learning and image recognition, uh, we're getting closer to being able to do the kinds of screens we'd like to do to identify all the players that might be involved in these processes. Um, and that, again, it's going to be a bit of a challenge, but we're doing that by imaging and not so much by the biochemistry. If I may change gears a little bit and talk about another research interest of yours, uh, which I also uh, at some point was quite uh, um, intrigued about, uh, when it comes to T-cell and T-cell activation and the role of particular transcription factors in, 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 in guiding this uh, this activation what so 
what's the role? So what has have you and your lab uh, research about the role of the transcription factor MYC and the distribution of this trans transcription factor upon uh, activation that you would like to share with the listeners? I kind of know what it is, but I would like to hear from you. <laughs> sure. Well, let me, I, I'd love to go all the way back to when we really started all this. Um, back in my first faculty position, still working with that first grad student, uh, Yufang Shi, uh, we decided we would um, take advantage of some of the, at that time, emerging technology to regulate various uh, gene targets to look at their roles in the apoptotic process we were looking at, which were in transformed T cells. And so the activation of these T cells would lead to their demise through this process of apoptosis. And it was kind of our initial handle into that process. Uh, and back then, there was no such thing as um, shRNA or siRNA. Um, at that time, we used antisense oligonucleotides, which surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, uh, have a rebirth in the form of uh, drugs. And that are showing incredible promise and as a whole new um, type of drug. But going all the way back then, we said, let's make a bunch of antisense oligonucleotides against all the things that we thought are important in T-cell activation. And at that time, not much was known. But our control was MYC because everybody knew that MYC turned on, uh, was, was transcribed and translated pretty early in T-cell activation. Let's use MYC as a control, which others had shown the antisense to MYC would uh, block proliferation. And so that would be our control. And we had all these others in the mix. We spent a lot of money at that time making um, antisense oligonucleotides and introducing them into cells. And Yufang came back and said, it worked, it worked great, it's amazing. The antisense for MYC completely inhibited the cell death in our system. Uh, that got us interested in MYC. We weren't really that interested in that before, although one of my best friends, um, who I got to know shortly after that, uh, was studying MYC. His name is Gerard Evan in the UK, phenomenal cancer biologist, uh, and he was studying MYC in a completely different context and was seeing a role for MYC in apoptotic cell death, driving apoptotic cell death. So the two of us converged, working completely independently, developing our theories. We moved into other cell types to look at MYC and apoptosis, uh, reached similar conclusions to Gerard and published uh, almost back-to-back -back papers. Um, first, he published before us, then we published before him. We'd never met, and then uh, we were both at a meeting uh, just on the program, and gave effectively the same talks, and met out in the hallway, and he looked at me and said, looked at my name badge and said, you, and I looked at his name badge and said, you, and he said, are we going to have a fight, or are we just going to go get a beer, and we <laughs> got a beer, and we've been best friends ever since. Um, he's a phenomenal scientist, and uh, it's kept my interest in Mick. Now, cut to many years later, um, I had a new postdoc, uh, expert in cell cycle, uh, and said something to me that I wish more postdocs would say, but it was a, a great moment. Uh, he came in, and I said, let's talk about what you, your project, what you work on. And he said, I don't care what I'll work on. I just want it to be hard. And at that time... <laughs> At that time, I was getting interested in what I thought would be a pretty fundamental problem. Lots of interest around that time in cancer metabolism. And um, there were meetings on cancer metabolism and a huge amount of excitement. But I got invited to those meetings. I think there were just not enough people working on it yet working on cancer metabolism. So I would get invited to those meetings because I was the cell death guy. So I'd talk about BCL2 family proteins and things like that. Nobody cared. They wanted to talk about glucose and glutamine. Um, and uh, as I listened to all those talks at those meetings, I'd hear a lot about cancer metabolism and how unique it was. 
But knowing the early literature on T cell metabolism, I said, this is a lot like activated T cells. This isn't so yeah. unique to cancer. Somebody should study that. And nobody seemed to be picking up the mantle. So when Runing Wang, this new postdoc came into the lab, now he's a quite successful scientist uh, as well. Um, Runing said, uh, you know, what's a, what's a good question? And I said, look, when you activate a T cell, T cells are unique. When you activate a CD8 positive T cell, uh, unlike any other cell in the adult, you activate it, it doesn't go straight into the cell cycle. It sits there for a day. And then when it goes, it's like a racehorse coming out of the gate, right? It, you can have a cell division every four hours. It's crazy, right? faster than any other cell. I know some people are gonna comment that they know a cell that goes faster, but that that's in very early development and it's not really <laughs> faster. Um, T cells are the racehorses of the cell cycle. And how do they prepare for that? What's happening in that 24 hours? There must be a huge metabolic component. So Renning interrogated that, he interrogate the, interrogated the uh, changes in transcription, the changes in metabolism, and putting it all together, and then uh, looking for the conserved um, transcription factor binding sites and the promoters of all the upregulated genes. He said, it looks like there's only a small number of genes that might be regulating this metabolic change. And among the top genes was MYC. And as we interrogated those different genes, we concluded, yep, it's MYC that is driving a large part of the metabolic rewiring during that first 24 hours to take cells into that um, full-on cell cycle um, race. So uh, again, that's kept us interested in MYC. Uh, subsequently, we were interested in um, looking at this in, at the single cell level, and that took us in another whole direction when we noticed that the way MYC comes on in different cells, uh, even in a population of seemingly identical T cells that are activated, um, there's disparities in the levels of MYC that come up and how those influence the long-term fate of the cell. So... Outside of just the science, you've actually brought up a really interesting point. Was, you, you had someone who was kind of a rival that you met at a meeting in each other's papers. And you were like, fight or beer. Now, now many times I've, I've, I've seen the fight or, you know, the, we're, we're going to be, you know, we, there can't be two fish in the same pond. I have to be, you know, ahead of you, that, that type of attitude. What do you think made it different? Just intrinsic personalities? was like like this is so obscure why not have the two of us work on it together because we can get more done like what what made it the beer conversation i think that's a really important thing you kind of jumped over but that's actually a big deal i think it is a big deal and i'll give you other examples of that throughout my career but um in that particular case it's our personalities and it was the fact that it was a very small field and we could help each other rather than than uh, antagonizing. It's not, here's the thing, and I, I think Gerard feels this way as well. Um, it's always been my feeling that I'm lucky to do this job. The public has decided that it's worth it for me to do this job. And so the public funds us to do this job. And I always think there's like a money back guarantee there. If we don't do our job to the best of our ability, they could just ask for their money back. They could just say, look, it's stupid to spend all this money on science. Uh, I don't think they will. I hope they won't. But the way to do this job the most effectively is to find those people with similar interests and find ways to work together. And that has always been the way. Now, that said, fighting can be good as long as it's meant in an intellectual way and not in a, not in a I'm going to destroy your laboratory behind the scenes way, uh, which doesn't do anybody any good. So uh, another wonderful friend in the apoptosis field, Andreas Strasser in um, Melbourne in Australia, uh, he and I would fight tooth and nail at meetings and just yell at each other and disagree about everything. 
and argue and argue and argue. And that was good for the field. These were vibrant arguments. And still, when we, he and I are going to be together at a meeting, he'll send me an email and say, we have to fight at this meeting. Let's fight, decide what we're going to fight about. We've got to do this. It keeps things lively. But then, yeah, then we go get a drink together. And, you know, and uh, I know his family. He knows mine. We're very good friends. We can have intellectual differences. But uh, he is a consummate scientist. And... Um, I have total respect for his work, and I like to hope he's got respect for mine. So um, you can have fights about the intellectual parts, but this sort of I'm going to destroy you by discrediting you or or uh, reviewing your papers and trashing them, that doesn't help anybody. Yeah, you got to be a good, a good player. I, sometimes I feel, do you think that um, people that are new or like people that don't have a lot of Because you can you can fight a lot maybe with people if you feel more confident about your position as a scientist. About do you think that it could be something a little bit more difficult for early career researchers? Is there a, a balance? How do you reach a balance between you know keeping things interesting and keeping people engaged versus getting people intimidated by a uh, seemingly aggressive uh, sometimes. Uh, too lively uh, uh, context. Oh, look, um, I fully appreciate how hard it is to break into science, to get uh, recognized, to get recognized as an individual scientist and as an individual thinker. Um, it's very challenging and it's tempting to think that the way to do this is to be cutthroat is to be first, is to undermine other people and just no matter what it takes, be the first one. Um, but that's not how I ever worked. I've always had this attitude that collaboration is better than competition if it's possible. Sometimes it isn't. But um, collaboration is a route to success. And it's more fun. It's much more fun to collaborate. So wherever possible, I found people who are like-minded and wanted to collaborate, even in the earliest, when I was a graduate student, when I was a uh, early postdoc or just into my first lab, finding collaborators, finding opportunities. And here's the, here's the trick. Um, the, the secret to collaboration is produce. Uh, if you say you're gonna do a set of experiments, do them mm -hmm. and share the data and work on it together. And when it comes to writing, don't wait, just, just write it. Just get the stuff written and get it submitted. And it's everyone's success. And people tend to be pretty generous. Um, people tend to be pretty good about giving recognition in a collaboration. Now we can share uh, first or senior authorships and um, the uh, Uh, communicating authors and, and such. Um, we can share those things. We get credit for it. And the trick is no one paper, usually. It's very rare that one paper makes your career. It's a body of work. So getting it out, being helpful to your colleagues, being of use, it gets you recognition. There's no better comment to get than to have a reputation as being a great collaborator. Right? That's a great reputation to get. And it will, it does point to success because the people you're collaborating with want to see you succeed as well. I think that's that's very important. Yeah. I think that as we're moving a little bit more to uh, less maybe technical conversations, more into career. I love to talk about the science. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I was going to suggest uh, to for us to look into a parallel world You are a very successful scientist and clearly very um, passionate about your 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 work. But if you were not a scientist, and this is a question that we like to ask our guests around the end of our conversation, what do you think you would be? Well, uh, I I would love to have been a singer songwriter. I would have loved that, but I simply didn't have the talent. Um, but I did once, I remember once at a meeting back in the days when we could actually have higher bands for, uh, meetings, international meetings and the band played and I got up and played with the band and somebody 
who was there at the meeting said, man, why are you a scientist? You, you should be a musician. And I say, sure, I could have made hundreds of dollars a year being a musician, probably. Um, and I, I still think that. Uh, also, at one point in my career, I really thought um, performance and, and writing uh, for performance, um, screenwriting and uh, television writing was way up there on my list of things I wanted to do. And uh, had I gone that route, uh, I was very lucky. I even had an agent and I was pitching ideas in Hollywood. And uh, had that ever actually happened, I would probably still be in rehab. So um, that's that was not really a, a promising career move. And again, I, I just didn't have the talent. So uh, the only thing really left to me that I think I do have a talent for is uh, is writing. And um, that would be something that I could I could imagine doing. And almost certainly I'd be, you know, keeping on the same theme. I'd be poor and an alcoholic. So um, like like many great writers. Um, so and hardly, I doubt I would ever have been a great writer. So no, I, it's pretty much this is it. This is, this it. is it. I I'm 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 gonna be a, as long as they'll let me do this, I'm gonna be a scientist. That's where your I liver really, is very happy about it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Let's say apoptosis for the liver, I guess. <laughs> but you know, you you could always go into the great zombie novel or something. You could kind of like oh, yeah. keep the science and or the screenplay, add in the death, but not quite the death. There could be, you know. <laughs> there could there could be something there. there. Could. Um I actually was asked by a friend who's the editor in chief of a journal, given an ultimatum, I had to write him a review article on the uh, apoptosis, where we were, where we are, and where we're going. And I'd written so, so, so many of these kinds of reviews that it was just painful. And um, I suddenly had the idea that I would write it in the form of a play. And he thought that was a great idea. He said, yes, I, it just poured out. I wrote the play. Of course, it's just stupid, but, um, but really fun. Um, I think it's called um, The Cell's Dilemma, an agony in five acts or something along those lines. And or three, I guess it was three acts, past, present and future. Um, and it was... Um, uh, published, although the journal really had kept writing to me and say, this is in the wrong format, you have to redo it. <laughs> and, and, and the editor, fortunately, was the editor in chief kept saying, no, this is commissioned, publish it the way it is. Uh, some great things happened. Uh, it was performed in Serbian. <laughs> um, uh, as I understand, somebody sent me a link that he had his class actually perform it. I think apologies to whoever I'm describing, it may not have been Serbian, but I, I think I seem to remember it was. But again, apologies if you were the if you were involved in that. Um, it was not in my language. So, um, and then there were also two um, wonderful illustrators in Spain who wanted to bring it out as a graphic novel. And they got a ways into it. I think it just became an overwhelming project and they didn't finish it, but they made some terrific drawings along the way um, uh, to illustrate it. So it's still out there. You can find it. I think it was in the um, Feb's journal uh, called, and it was The Cell's Dilemma. Um, but it was, a, it was a play about cell death processes. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. You know, maybe some listener will be will be uh, inspired to, to yeah. play. I, I actually think it would be a horrible play, but um, but it would but it it probably would be a creative way to teach cell death in in the class, I guess. So maybe <laughs> um, might be a little out of date. It was a few years ago that I did it. Um, and again, it's a vibrant field. Lots of things are happening. Lots of movement in the field. And like I said at the at, towards the beginning, um, I think where the action is is in this whole idea of cells that almost die. Mm -hmm. Now we're calling them flatliners, cells that um, have all the appearance of engaging the cell death process, but don't actually die, and how that changes and how that contributes to phenomena like 
minimum residual disease and cancer mm -hmm. and, and other phenomena. Um, so I, I think, at least for me, that's where a lot of our research is moving, or some of our research at least, because we have a lot of different interests in the lab. Yeah. Okay, so self-purgatory. You're not call it okay. That's good. That's good. I like <laughs> not it. Quite there. Poor cells. They didn't. They do nothing wrong, and they're sent there to not That's die. Right. Yeah, I, I love the idea. Of course, n none of this evolved to make cancer worse. There's no such thing. Um, it, it's clearly cancer hijack systems that mm -hmm. are already present in the body. So my suspicion, with absolutely no evidence, is that this is part of how tissues respond to damage. And so you can imagine a focus of damage and a penumbra, uh, penumbra of um, dying cells, cells that are killing themselves as a consequence of the changes in the immediate environment. And then around that are cells that maybe got a signal to die, but didn't quite get all the way there. And those cells come back, uh, maybe call them zombies or whatever you want. Those cells come back from that brink of death and now have a mission and they're going to invade and fill in that that tissue until true complete regenerative processes can occur. I mean, when it goes cancer, it's a zombie, right? It almost dies or dies and comes back and then destroys everything around it. Right. That's your next play. That's yes. I zombie. No, no. No, we have enough I zombie stuff cancer out there. Cell. <laughs> we yeah. got undead people like fungi yeah. zombie fungi i love I the zombie think... fungi they're great <laughs> i don't know they're ugly oh gosh those heads <laughs> yeah well thank you so much for coming on um are you on twitter or anything else are you looking for nope. people are you if you're if you're hunting for oh yes absolutely always looking for talented postdocs people who want to really explore so that's the trick. Um, we are a laboratory with our mission in terms of trainees is we get people from the um, scientist level. You know, I'm a competent scientist. Now I want to run my own show. I want to be the independent scientist. And I will work very hard to get you there. We'll develop projects. We'll develop programs. And we will, and you will take those projects with you as a, as a um, emerging independent scientist, uh, if you want. I mean, it's entirely up to you. Anything you do in my lab is yours. So, um, and, and we're really looking for explorers, people who want to explore fundamental biological principles that revolve around the themes of the lab, but there are several themes like we've sort of touched on. Um, so yeah, it's uh, by all means, let me know if you're interested in a position, send me your stuff and we'll see what we can do. It's great to hear. All right, well, thank you for being on. Thank you so much for joining. It was a pleasure. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at @immunopodcast or via email info at immunologypodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. See you next time. <laughs>